So Warren, um, can we explore now moving from research just more broadly um, some of the other things, there's been a lot of them that you've done in your career. So um, one of the things that strikes me when I look back over your CV and a lot of the things that you've done um, is just how widely you've travelled. I mean you've visited so many countries and continents and worked with universities and research organisations internationally. Has, sort of travelling and getting out and about been important to you? Why, how, what, stri what drove you or, to do these things? How'd that happen? Well, I, uh, I guess probably uh, my mentor, Bill Back, mm -hmm. who loved to travel. He just loved to travel. Uh -huh. uh, and <clears throat> But he pointed out that you could see and utilise uh, sort of end members, by, in my particular case I go to a very arid areas and you see a different hydrology. Mm -hmm. Most hydrologic processes were developed for um, humid climate environments so all, everything is kind of focused around uh, that mm -hmm. and yet when you s start looking at arid, very arid areas or extremely wet areas you see that different things in the hydrologic process are important mm -hmm. and so that was one aspect and I came from a, again uh, an environment of a very small community and when I got to university I met all these people from all over the world and I thought Gee, that's really interesting we all have the same problems and every culture is is sort of solved this in a different way and it'd be kind of fun to in addition to looking at the hydrogeology in those mm -hmm. areas to see how the culture uh, how they, these people address different problems mm -hmm. and uh, I, that, I guess probably that's the emphasis uh, to driving. I married a, 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 an international lady, a German lady. Uh, maybe it's my uh, small uh, Midwestern uh, environment that forces me to look out. I don't know. But I, and I've enjoyed uh, uh, meeting and seeing different academic environments mm -hmm. and, and working with different people. They always bring different insights. Everybody has such a great skill set mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, it's, it's just been really, really positive. Mm -hmm. And looking at your professional service, I mean, it's an incredible array of professional service, Warren. I mean, that's what drives you to do the professional service that you have and continue to do. And we'll explore yeah. in a moment some yeah. of those in, in particular. But there's obviously a driver and an interest and an enthusiasm for professional service. Yeah, I, I think, again, it was Bill Back's mentoring. Mm. He felt that, uh, that it was very important that people in the U.S. Geological Survey didn't become isolated and insular. He felt that national meetings were important and that you should be organizing conferences and that mm -hmm. you should be organizing and involved with review of, of journal articles and become editor, if you could, and uh, associate editors, and to be actively involved. And the survey, to much to their credit, was very supportive of this. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they, that was a culture of that is looked on as uh, a very positive thing. I mean, I don't know as it had any impact on promotions, but it certainly wasn't uh, negative. They made time and money available to travel to uh, national meetings, and and uh, so there was a lot of encouragement, and it just seemed. If you stand back and look at an organization like NGWA or GSA, you find that it's all volunteer. I mean, there's certainly there's a core staff, mm -hmm. but the the, the 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 national meetings are really put together by people who volunteer. Some people just go to these meetings and don't realize how much effort and time yeah, has been involved in organizing and getting the time slots and arguing about one day you're going to have it on, whether it's going to be a Thursday or a Tuesday. And and <clears throat> there's a lot going on. And uh, I felt that uh, that was an area that I sort of giving back. The, the hydrogeology has been very great to me. The ju survey has been. And this was just, I thought, as part of an obligation as a professional that you should, in fact, uh, participate in these uh, professional organizations and try to aid uh, in uh, integrating and making uh, the information that we have as professionals available to students. Uh, I, uh, I was 
when I was with the NGWA, I initiated a, the Darcy Lecture Series because, again, I thought it was something that we as a professional organization should do because this is, this is get students involved. You know, they hear the same old thing from the tired old dead professors, and here is to bring in a lively, really excellent speaker who gets them excited about There's neat stuff going on. And that was the idea to build enthusiasm amongst students. And, and, and it, there are a number of different ways of doing it. But anyway, I felt strongly that was a role of professional organizations. So in terms of the Darcy lecturership idea, um, so for you it was really, it is about science, but also science communication. Yes, absolutely. And inspiring yeah, people. get students that fired up yeah. and, and get them an opportunity mm -hmm. to listen to different alternative ways of looking at problems and how different people address and, and resolve uh, these problems. I, it's a, I was taken directly from the Birdsall Rice, mm -hmm. or at that time it was just a Birdsall lecture. It was just modeled after that, and we mm -hmm. tried to use the same kind of structure in selecting uh, uh, new... Um, uh, lecturers, uh, I actually acted for a whole, for a rather a long time to kind of coordinate activity. But previous lecturers are the ones who, in fact, select the future lecturers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, my role in that was to kind of coordinate and make sure that that we didn't select somebody who was somebody's brother-in-law who. Uh, uh, wanted to do something like that. It was, you know, it was considered to be, we wanted somebody really active and dynamic. There are a lot of people who are doing really good science, but not necessarily great speakers, or mm -hmm. not necessarily can meet the dean and, and the department chairs and sell a program, and that's what we were looking for. That's really good, and so you yourself had been the Birdsall lecturer yeah. in the GSA, mm -hmm. it was 1989, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so how, what was it like being the Birdsall Lecture. Well, it was interesting. You've got a, a snapshot in time because it all took place in, within a year and you mm -hmm. visited, I think I visited 40 or 50, 45 <laughs> different places. Again, U.S. Geological Survey was helpful in relieving me of uh, my responsibility so I didn't have to have a, uh, uh, I'm essentially open the time available. Mm -hmm. It was my yeah. research, but they were encouraging this. Mm -hmm. And it was it was kind of interesting. There were some a number of surprising universities that were doing really great stuff that you hadn't thought about. The students were articulate and right on. And some more famous universities where the students and the faculty were kind of, hmm, not, uh, not what I had kind of expected. So it, it was enlightening. And, and you can't always judge a book by its cover, or its reputation, or whatever. I thought it was uh, very interesting. I, so, yeah, if um, for the young guys out there now, um, if an opportunity to be a Birdsall Dross oh, lecturer or a Darcy do lecturer, it. yeah, do it in a second, a heartbeat, uh -huh. even if it costs you, you know, your uh, a year of your professional career, uh -huh. do it. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's it was really interesting. I got a lot. I met a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It generated an awful lot of work because people met you and then they wanted you to review their manuscripts or something so it turns out there was a lot of negative aspect or additional work that you work. doesn't show up on the uh, on the the, the program yeah. <clears throat> but it was uh, at that time in the late 80s there were a lot of geologic programs that were just starting to get going in terms of hydrogeology and I met with a number of departmental chairs to meet the deans to show them that we really needed to add a hydrogeologist position. Mm -hmm. And so that was, uh, and I considered uh, in retrospect, that was a fairly effective uh, use of my time in there because there were a number of, of programs that just started and I was able to give really positive and show the a huge number of one ads for hydrogeologists and, mm -hmm. and there was a great potential, it looked like a long term um, worthwhile kind of addition to a program. Mm -hmm. Turning into another aspect of service, um, you were the editor in chief of Groundwater um, from 1996 to 2002. Tell us a little bit about that. How did you uh, get into to the gig of being the editor-in-chief of Groundwater, and did you enjoy it? What did you learn? Just well, reflect, it's interesting. Reflect I, on that. I'll us. give you a little history, first of yeah. all. Uh, Jay Lair had been editor-in-chief of, of Groundwater for, I don't know, 
20 years or more, maybe, anyway, a long time. Mm -hmm. And he ran a, a foul and was uh, convicted of a felony. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was on the board of directors of the National Groundwater Association, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Gwasi at that time. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was critical that we get a really big name, well-known individual to kind of step in. I didn't want the groundwater to flop and flounder. And I encouraged John Bredehoft to take that position immediately after uh, uh, Jay left. And uh, because I thought John's great reputation and uh, really a really bright guy. And uh, John agreed. And uh, so for the next two or three years, I guess a three year stint, uh, John was the uh, editor, but he was also a little reluctant to change things because it had been uh, Jay's baby and he didn't want to go in as a new kid on the block and, oh, we'll do this and change that. But it was quite obvious to me that things needed to be, the mm -hmm. journal needed to be upgraded in terms of the, the selection of the type of, of articles that were, we need to move away more from the case study into more analytical kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so I, uh, uh, and then when John, uh, his term was up, he was, that was, he didn't want to do it any longer. And I was asked to do it by, uh, I'd kept an active interest in the journal and I was asked to, to, to do this, and I looked at it as a, a really challenge, and I made a lot of changes in the approach, and that was improved upon by Mary Anderson, who had it after I did, and by Frank now. They've continued to hone it and improve it. But I've, I'm really quite proud of the uh, work I did as, uh, as the editor at that time, I think I made some significant changes, not only in the in the uh, structure of the the journal, but uh, the kinds of material uh, that we uh, addressed. And it was an opening to me. I hadn't <clears throat> had never been an editor before, but I didn't realize the constraints of pages and the cost of mailing and all of this that starts coming into play. And uh, we were just on the verge of, of, at that time, of electronic, how should we go in the electronic future? And mm -hmm. it wasn't clear. Uh, we had a whole cadre of people who really wanted the, a paper journal and wanted to make notes on the thing as they were flying about the country. And yet ever, another group of people wanted to go totally electronic and save two or $300,000 a year in mailing. And, and so it was uh, kind of some interesting behind uh -huh. the scenes uh, uh -huh. Things that I, you know, normally you don't think about as as a scientist, mm -hmm. but it was a it was an interesting experience. I did it for six years, and uh, I put on about fifteen pounds because I, the way that the U.S. Geological Survey did it, I couldn't take any compensation if I did it on uh, on survey time, and I so I I wanted the uh, compensation. And uh, so I just did it on weekends and evenings. And I was really super clean about not doing it during working hours. Mm -hmm. And so it was done on weekends and evenings. As a consequence, I <laughs> didn't do my exercises and put on a lot of weight that I haven't lost. The, so it was, a, I'd saw it was, I'd call it was a 10 pound term. A 10 pound term. <laughs> uh -huh. um, one of the things that I remember, I think it was in um, my first visit in 1996 to the USGS in Reston, uh, was a discussion that we had around a number of your editorials uh, that you'd written. And I'd read a number of these before, and, uh, and we'd discussed a number of more recent ones at that time. I mean, reflecting back on that now, Warren, you've written over 20 or 20 or more editorials for journals, groundwater, mm. and, and 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 otherwise, I mean, that's probably more than most. Well, so I, <laughs> what are your thoughts on writing editorials? You obviously like writing them. Well, I I find it a way of of organizing my thoughts. Yeah. And then after you've organized your thoughts, oh well, maybe somebody else is interested in this. But yeah. originally, when I took over groundwater, Jay Lair had always yeah. written all of the editorials. Uh, it was occasionally to have a guest editorial, but largely he wrote the editorials. And I felt it was more of a community resource, the editorial. And so I really encouraged people from all 
aspects of hydrogeology to submit an editorial. And I only filled in spots that I didn't have uh, from an editorial. <laughs> there was nothing there. And I thought they had, if we do little surveys, and it's interesting, the response is that a lot of people read the editorials. Mm -hmm. You don't, as, an, as a writer at editorial, you don't get a lot of response. Uh, some of you get, attaboy, you're right on, you know, well done. Uh, some are just think you're absolutely idiot. Uh, but generally, it's not a great, uh, uh, from my stuff anyway, it's not been a lot of huge interchange with people. Mm -hmm. But it's been uh, enjoyable. I'm still writing one, as you are well aware. That's right. I, yeah. uh, I, I have a view that we ought to be looking at uh, the curriculum at, uh, at the universities in a different way, mm -hmm. with the changing dynamics of uh, MOOCs and... Mm -hmm. and uh, term limits on, uh, on faculty and uh, changing economic conditions. So I think we need to look at our, our structure a bit. And I'd like to see it in terms of mass and energy fluxes. Again, this is my thinking on it. But it's an editorial. It's still in the process of formulation. Mm -hmm. How do you come up with the ideas? Do they sort of come <laughs> to you while you're um, in the garden or cleaning yeah. the dishes or taking a shower in the morning? Yeah, or, yeah. sort of. I mean, I'll just something that yeah. bothers me or think about it. Uh, I read the editorials in Science and Nature and, and uh, on a weekly basis, and I always read that. I subscribe to the New York Times, mm -hmm. and I read the editorials first thing in the morning. It gets my blood boiling. Yeah, kill those guys. Uh, I get fired up when I read them, and so I think, well, maybe this, uh, some of my ideas will have uh, inspired somebody. I don't know whether they have or not. Mm -hmm. As I say, the feedback from an editorial is, eh. It's interesting, isn't it? I find that process personally really enjoyable as well. I think it's a really useful thing to be doing. Do you think, in general, if we could be general about this stuff, and we have to be careful not to be too rough and ready, but do you think that as scientists and engineers more generally and perhaps if we look at the groundwater community and profession more specifically that that in general we're sufficiently reflective philosophical and and so on i think some of that comes out in editorial writing but do I, you think we are no i actually do we need I, to do more of that? i think so i yeah. i would like to stand back it's quite clear that hydrogeology is really societal based and it's, it's mm -hmm. clear to me, and it has been uh, since the 1950s, that what we're looking at water resources, we have, right now it's quite clear, we have to have sustainable water, soil, air, and energy. It's mm -hmm. quite clear that this, these are societal interests. Well, it's always been clear that water is a really important aspect. In fact, Water Resources Research, a journal, and I think it started in 1963 or 4, there was a lot of discussion at that time, and it started out as a journal that was originally to be half social and half technical. Mm -hmm. Well, the social aspect never worked out, and it ultimately migrated to be largely a, a technical journal, but it was quite clear. It wasn't clear how to get there, mm -hmm. but it was quite clear that we needed to tie in economics, society, social aspects, and I mean simply moving of populations and changing agriculture projects. How do you integrate that into water resources? And, and then, the, and of course, the, the economics aspects of this whole thing. It all fits in there. Mm -hmm. And with the development of the computer model, one could kind of see how it would go. But it, uh, it's taken a little longer to get there than I thought it would. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be a little more straightforward, but not being a modeler, I don't fully appreciate all the problems that, that must be involved in different codes and getting them because the economists have developed their models and we've developed our models and, and are they truly integrated and then how do you put the the social scientists, uh, how do they fit into this whole picture and yet it's clear that that's the way we should be going and and I and we are you know we are at this point right now I'm working on a project on the southern high plains that it does in fact incorporate all of those aspects and I think that's the future it's not clear to me the role of journal articles how we're going to publish all of this stuff whether it'll be a, a classic journal articles or not I, I kind of worry about whether uh, mm -hmm. the journals as we know them are going to continue forward uh, I think they will evolve uh, in some way it's not mm -hmm. again it 
It's not clear how, mm -hmm. but I, I suspect that they will evolve in a, a different way. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I just wanted to say on the editorials that I've managed, I think, quite successfully to use a number of your editorials in my graduate classes yeah. to uh, to stir things up a little well, and get some discussion going. So, well, that's what an editorial know. is supposed to be. It's not yeah. the final answer. It's just one person's view of, yeah. of what's a problem. So I personally did want well, to say that I've really valued you. your um, <laughs> sort of global thinking and uh, being able to turn to you and look to you as a as a philosopher friend, Warren. Yes. So uh, it's, uh, you've made major contributions there. Um, I want to talk, you mentioned earlier that you'd met C.V. Tice, yeah. you know, obviously one of the yeah. great groundwater gods and gurus. Yes. And, um, but I also know, because um, you've had uh, personally signed monographs um, from both C.V. Tice and mm -hmm. also M. King Hubbard. That's right. Um, so you talked a little bit about C.V. Tice. How did you come to meet M. King Hubbard? And it's especially interesting that there's a connection here because uh, you also uh, won the NGWA's M. King Hubbard Award <laughs> as well. So, And you, you met M. King. Tell us about M. King. Well, it was interesting. I was on a faculty at uh, Texas Tech, and as a junior faculty member, one of your requirements is if... And M. King Hubbard was the, I believe, the AAP Distinguished lecture. Uh -huh. I think it was AAPG. Mm -hmm. In any event, he was one of, on the lecture circuit. And as the junior faculty member, you're the guy with the get the car and meet him at the airport and make sure he gets checked in and you know <laughs> do, do all of the kind of uh, logistics standpoint. Uh, well, I did that and of course it was a great opportunity and if I've got this guy, I'm not going <laughs> to as you can tell, I love to talk and uh, uh, so we started conversations of, uh, what would, if you were to teaching today, how would you start out? Would you still use uh, uh, this little column that you illustrated in your mm -hmm. classic uh, mm -hmm. 1940s work? Anyway, we got a lot of discussion, and then it turns out he was, this was in Lubbock, Texas, and we had a, the day he was to fly out, there was a huge sandstorm, and there was nothing flying for a day. And so uh, here was M. King Hubbard, and here am I, and uh, oh, wow, <laughs> I got an extra day one on one with M. King. What a great experience! Uh -huh. Very, uh, you know, I, I've known that he's been uh, grumpy to people who uh, don't think clearly, and it's perfectly justifiable. He's a, uh, he w but to me, he was just a most helpful and pleasant person. I mean, he was just no uh, no heirs or anything. He was just extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought very highly of him. And of course, it was really great when I was received the M. King Hubbard of Metal. Uh, I have a medal with his yeah. background on it. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was really... Uh, uh, it was very, very special. Mm -hmm. So, what? When did so you met in King Hubbard in which year was it? Roughly yeah, about nineteen. I'm going to guess about uh, nineteen seventy, mm -hmm. uh, seventy or seventy one. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was later than that. Uh, uh, might have been, might have been later. And uh, let me see. I was teaching at Texas Tech, so it might have been later than that. It would have been like maybe seventy seven, seventy eight. And so you won the M. King Hubbard Award in about 2002, yeah, there about, yeah, so some yeah, 30 years later. Yeah, 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 right. That's amazing. Yeah, that's yeah. really good. Is there any particular one thing that you can recall about the conversation with M. King uh, fondly or one thing that you remembered that sort of had an impact on the way you thought or... Well, anything I, that strikes you now, reflecting? Uh, just in his response to, uh, I, if, uh, I asked him, if you were going to teach hydrogeology or hydrology right now, how would you go about it? Mm. And he said, well, just the way I laid it out in, in my monograph. He really? said, in this, you know, uh -huh. start with an example in a, a lab of this column in the flow. And, and uh, so this actually, is his theory of groundwater yeah, motion from, monograph, yeah, the right, famous yeah. paper. Yeah. And uh, and I actually followed that. I used I would haul these things into into the lecture class, and we'd watch colored fluids move around and look at the head. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, I, I, an approach that. And anyway, he suggested that, and and I followed up on it. That's Makes amazing. sense. But I, I have a fond spot in my 
heart for M. King Hubbard. Yeah, that's just an incredible um, experience and opportunity. Yeah. One of the things, Warren, that strikes me, um, we've known each other for some time now, mm. and I've um, had the opportunity to, to work with you and learn from you and, <laughs> and, and all of that, mm. and is just the incredible energy that you have. <laughs> and even sitting here today talking with you, again, <laughs> the energy, the dynamic uh, person that is you and the, you know where does all the energy where well, what is the source of this energy uh, where is it coming from I have no idea <laughs> I, uh, I'm just there's so much in life that I want to see and do mm. that I have guess you always that, been like yeah, this yeah I've always been kind of interested in new things and uh, I guess that's why if you look at my CV you'd say my god all of these strange different things mm -hmm. that he's done well it's part of us that I'm uh, I'm bored once I figure something out I want to go on to something Something else, mm -hmm. and I don't do the same thing forever. And kind of find it. Although professionally, I suspect that if you take follow the rule of reductionism, you get better and better. You're the, the the foremost expert on this infinitesimally small thing. I don't I don't find that mm -hmm. interesting, and I want to go through life having interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you managing, you, you apparently retired at some point. <laughs> yeah. I sometimes think that you failed retirement. Failed retirement, moment, completely. Fa failed retirement <laughs> 101. Yeah. I mean, so are you, are you, are you, how are you finding the balance of retirement and still traveling and working and, <laughs> and I, I all of that? I haven't retired. It's just that <laughs> yeah. I, I am paying for all my pension rather than having the federal government pay for it mm -hmm. or my my uh, modest sum I get for teaching at uh, Michigan State University. I still teach a course in hydrogeology, mm -hmm. and uh, I team teach it, and uh, this, and I, I enjoy it. I lo love interacting with students, and uh, mm -hmm. I found it difficult to get uh, graduate students in the modern business environment because you have to have grants in order to support students. Uh, back in my day, I just paid for my education. I didn't have any assistantships or graduate fellowships or anything. I just paid for it. Mm -hmm. And but now I've, all students expect to be supported, which is it's fine. But what happens? In, and nobody will ever say this, but it's very difficult to get a grant if you're retired because the granting agencies really want to give the money to the young as they should. Mm -hmm. And if there's a, such a pie. So anyway, I, I, the bottom line is that I haven't been terribly successful in grants. Part of it, I think, is not the ideas. Part of it's the fact that I'm 75. Mm -hmm. And uh, who wants to support a guy 75 years old? What's the future here, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I'm not bitter about it, but I wish that there were a way I could... Uh, I'll work with graduate students while well, I'm on a lot of committees yeah. and, and I, I do work with them but I don't direct them at all. Have you found over the years that the nature of what motivates you and gets you out of bed in the morning has changed? I mean I reflect and on, I think it was my second to last trip to the US a, a few years ago where I visited you and Dave Hinman and mm -hmm. Remke Van Dam and mm -hmm. others at Michigan State <clears throat> or staying at your place and we're up sort of at five in the morning yeah, eating I think, your own <laughs> homemade granola for breakfast <laughs> yeah. and like having this really robust mm -hmm. and rigorous discussion about a research issue and it was just all on it was great yeah. um, what but hopping out of bed at five in the morning to get into the university by seven or seven thirty yeah. you know, I can understand Understand maybe the young grad student thinking that way, or perhaps you'd hope thinking that way. Well, it's just the and way you I are work. now doing uh, it still. Uh, yeah, I've got a <laughs> 6 a.m. flight tomorrow morning out of yep. Adelaide, so it means I get up at 3:30 to get to a cab to yeah. four to get to the airport. Mm -hmm. I'm just a morning person. I mm -hmm. do better in the morning, and and uh, I'm I've always been lucky. I hardly wait to get to work. I've got so many interesting things to work on. Gosh, I can. I, just need to get in. So, and it's the science that drives. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, just interesting problems. Yeah, and yeah. talking with, I have coffee in the morning with Remka and, and Dave Hyman, and as we walk him back and forth to the coffee shop and just chatting about a variety of things, I find it very stimulating and, mm. and rewarding. No, it's fantastic, it's great. Um, we talked a little bit about meeting M. King Hubbard and you winning the um, National Groundwater Association's M. King Hubbard Award or Medal um, in 2002. I mean, you've won a number of uh, big awards. Mm. How important is recognition to you? 
Well, I think it's uh, there's an ego in everybody, and uh-huh. uh, yeah, I think it's really nice to recognize, have your peers recognize that you've made some accomplishment that generally is say, okay, that uh, changed our way of thinking, or you made some impact on society. Yeah, I think it it would be it's human nature to be. Uh, uh, pleased with any kind of a recognition like that. Do you think yeah. it, you know, does, do you think it helps to keep feeding the addiction with research? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it, something drives you. I don't know what it is, whether it's insecurity or whether it's, uh, you know, I don't want to be a Freudian about this. I don't really know <laughs> uh, what, yeah, what drives yeah. me, but yeah. I, I would guess that there must be some reward from this. I get a huge thrill every time I publish a paper. Yes, yeah. got that out. And it's always a struggle for me. It's making comments and read, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not easy to get a paper out. Are there any forms uh, of peer recognition or professional recognition that are really, um, it's hard to distinguish, I'm sure, but really stand out for you as, as a highlight where you're really particularly proud? Well, I think the work that I did as editor of, of Groundwater, I feel that I really... Uh, accomplished what I had set out to do and uh, it was uh, a recognition that I had uh, by my peers that I was actually selected and then and, and generally approved mm-hmm. uh, circulation went up and and general um, uh, at that time they didn't have the impact factor but it uh, we generally got a better and better comments about the, the uh, quality of the journal and so yeah I feel very very pleased about that. Mm-hmm. What satisfaction has teaching and mentoring given you, Warren, in your career? Well, I haven't done a great deal of mentoring. I've had uh, some uh, within the U.S. Geological Survey, not formally, but I uh, had some. Uh, teaching I really enjoy. I like the idea of trying to challenge uh, analogies. We all learn by analogies. Mm-hmm. and. It, Finding a new analogy uh, to for some kind of a process mm-hmm. is uh, is challenging, and I uh, kind of I'm a problem solver. I like to solve problems. I love field work mm-hmm. because you have this simple conceptual model. Oh, we'll go to this place and we'll we'll mm-hmm. get this sample. Well, you get you can't get there because there's a mud hole or there's a gate there that you don't have the key to or you get to the well and the pump has been removed or the the uh, the well doesn't have a sampling spot so all of these are problems that you have to resolve and i enjoy field work and resolving those kind of problems they they can be terribly frustrating Mm -hmm. but it's also a great solution to uh, be able to solve those kinds of problems. I am sure you get the same kind of response and when you uh, do your modeling and you, yes, you got the right thing in it. Yes, that's a clever kind of solution to this problem. And boundary condition, we can handle this way and that mm-hmm. way. Yeah, I'm sure you get the same yeah, kind no, of Absolutely, problem. and I think that, look, you know, I often feel that the more research that I do, the more hooked I get. Yeah, with it. absolutely. And it's, yeah, obviously. It doesn't go away. <laughs> yeah, no, it's sort of innate and it's in there. I think it's, it must be uh, nature and a bit of nurture, but a lot of it's nature. Yeah, yeah look, that's, that's great. Um, Warren, what do you see as your greatest legacy oh. in hydrogeology? <laughs> well, I guess, as I mentioned earlier, that several of uh, groups of paper have changed the way we thought about different mm-hmm. processes and I think that's uh, what research is about uh, understanding fundamental processes a little clearer uh, mm-hmm. maybe making some different assumptions and looking at it I, I don't know as a legacy I would say that I've used uh, uh, hydrogeology flow and chemistry to look at some more classic uh, geologic problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, I don't know if that's a legacy or it's just a, a philosophy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would guess that those papers that where uh, we've looked at uh, different approaches, uh, figuring out the, uh, the recharge on the Southern High Plains and an independent method is rather societally important Mm -hmm. and uh, you know we kind of looked at it in a different using a different approach and it was Mm -hmm. uh, I think it changed the way people look at it uh, Mm -hmm. about things so I 
don't know is that's a legacy, but uh, that's my perception. I, again, you could pick a paper, you say, oh, this has got a great citation, and say, that's my legacy. I don't is think there, so. Is it, we, we're making kind of a virtual time capsule taping yeah. today, but if we were to make a physical time capsule and to bury it underground, you know, what, is there one or two, I know, is there one or two papers that, uh, we, that you would, three papers uh, that you know. would put in, is this just an impossible question? Well, I, I like to, of course, the last thing you're working on is the most important one, the one I'm working on right now uh -huh. with your colleague Vincent Post. That's yeah. the most important work. Well, if, you know, three years ago it would have been something else. It's really difficult thought. to... Yeah to make those comments. You, you work as you go along and ultimately uh, your colleagues or society ultimately make the call on whether this was a contribution yeah. or not. It's very difficult for me to see uh, in the future. I have uh, um, a great deal. You can kind of see where you think we should go in the future of things, but it's not clear how to get there. And so, I, looking back as legacy, it's the same way. I'm not sure if that the past is a key to the future or not. <laughs> the geologic <laughs> yes. corridor. But if you, um, interesting on that point, if we were to sort of go back in a time machine right now to 1960, um, and you were around. <laughs> um, what were you thinking back then about hydrogeology? Could you see this last 50 or so years unfold at all? I mean, has it been sort of pr as predicted as people had conceptualized? Has it been, ha has there been some shock value in it? Well, it's yeah. interesting as coming from a chemistry or geochemical background, mm -hmm. I kind of saw the big contaminant coming, uh, contaminant work coming. Mm -hmm. I didn't, wasn't ever participated. In fact, uh, I met John Cherry just the, the, the month that he had been hired at Waterloo. He had, uh, he and I shared a room together at a Penrose conference. And uh, he had a vision mm -hmm. similar to what I saw. He thought that contaminant uh, work was going to be uh, the, really the future. And I agreed completely, and we talked about it. And obviously, John Cherry took us to a whole new uh, level and uh, was, uh, really drove the program at Waterloo for a number of years mm -hmm. in contaminant hydrogeology. I could see it coming. I, again, it wasn't stuff that I, even though I was chemically oriented, it was not particularly stuff that I was interested in doing. Uh, but, you know, you can still see it even though you're not interested in it. But I, uh, other parts, uh, I didn't, uh, other parts of hydrogeology, I, you know, I'd like to claim I had vision, I didn't see any changes coming. Mm -hmm. Any uh, lost opportunities that we need to oh. be taking up on? <laughs> well, always, uh, you know, personally, and yes, uh, Never, you never should look back. But uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I think that hydrogeology now is in the, the focus of looking at the integration of, of uh, basin scale um, economics and society as well as the, the physics of the flow. And, and because we do have to look at sustainable water resources, mm -hmm. sustainable uh, soils, and just sustainable energy. And these are, are part of our new culture and we should be thinking how best hydrogeology should fit into this. I mean, you know, we've gone way beyond learning well pump test analysis and into a much more integrated view of hydrogeology and I think that's the right way to go. Do you see, um, in your view, a need, um, if not it's already probably happening in part, a way for us to move away from reductionist thinking? or um, a balancing of reductionist versus perhaps integration approaches? Yeah. Well, my view is that the, the, the future is, is really truly integrating and in, in looking at societal aspects as well as the, just the physics of the flow. I mean, I think we've made successful, really, really successful uh, analysis uh, of, of aquifer. We still lack uh, the ability to get a, a three-dimensional view of hydraulic conductivity, and I'm not sure that we'll ever get there in terms of, uh, I mean, that's one of the great un, unsolved problems in hydrogeology. And uh, I don't know as we can, how much more effort we should put in that. I mm -hmm. think that better, uh, 
uh, effort or better return on our investment will be this basin scale, large scale social uh, thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I'm not. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm not concerned about the technical development of how we characterize an aquifer. I am, but I think that there is uh, limited re return on that right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe some new technology will come available. Uh, you can put in nanobots and then they will move through the aquifer and beam things out to you and uh, you'll be able to get a better uh, construction of the, atmos uh, the aquifer, but mm -hmm. I don't see it right now. You just said a moment ago, Warren, that you should never look back. Yeah. But if you were asked to look back and you had the opportunity perhaps to do things differently or do it all again, is there anything, uh, I know, is there anything else? Anything you do differently? Oh, I, obviously, there's all kinds of things you would you would do. Which, yeah, I wish I had made an investment in Apple computer, you know, or uh, uh, in retrospect. But uh, no, I, I just don't. That's not my philosophy. You make the mm -hmm. best choice with the information you have at the time, mm -hmm. and you go forward with it. It's it's fruitless to look back. And say, oh God, I should have done that. Oh, if I'd only done this. I I think that's it's not my way of life. So I, some people may maybe be able to reconstruct the past. I don't. Uh, the past is mm -hmm. the past. So the tape that we're making today, Warren, will uh, at some point be online. Oh, great. And accessible to, to the planet. And uh, yeah. hydrogeologists around the world will be looking at and downloading the tape. And, you know, groups of young hydrogeologists and engineers and others will be looking at the tape. and. Are there any messages that you want to leave to mm. the next generation of hydrogeologists who are starting out their careers, doing graduate school in groundwater hydrology now, and sort of looking at this tape? Just the classic, follow your dreams. Mm -hmm. Don't just take a job because you want to make money. Take it because it's interesting and it's exciting, and if you have to take a cut in salary to do some more exciting job, do it. Mm -hmm. Follow your dreams, that's my advice. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Is there an, anything else that you want to make sure that we've captured in our time capsule tape? Um, uh, <laughs> probably, I'll think about something six weeks from now. <laughs> but right now, uh, now I just, uh, I think that uh, the hydrogeology has continued to evolve. Uh, I say I'm concerned about how we as the journals, how they're going to evolve handling this new kind of integrated uh, view of, uh, of, uh, of hydrogeology. You can see easily how they developed as a model with reductionism. You publish this little thing, well, I've got a square aquifer, now I've got a triangular aquifer. Got, you know, this kind of, I don't mean to belittle that because that was what we were doing in the 50s and 60s, but the point is that it's not clear to me that how we're going to be able to communicate with this uh, integrated view. Is this going to be a big thing online that you access, or will it be how we're going to evolve this? I, again, I think there's, it's clear that it's going to change, but it's not clear to me in what direction it's going to change. Mm -hmm. so, That's fantastic. Well, okay. well look, you know, um, it's been an absolute privilege and honour to be able to interview you for our time capsule project all right. <laughs> and to, to hear all of your reflections but also some of your perspective views on how we're going to move forward and just to uh, have a little bit more insight into the career and life of Warren Wood. So right. thank you very much for your well, time. Thank you. It's been a privilege. And, and remember that as you're interviewing me, but I am a product of all of the people that are surrounded me and have contributed. My poor dear wife who has moved all over the world with me and, and yeah. uh, always sort of uh, made it easy when I've traveled. She's always, always you know, if the garage door is broken, I don't hear about it till I get home because it's, if I'm 8,000 miles away, there's not a damn thing I can do about the broken garage door. <laughs> she fixes it. So it's been, she's been a really wonderful partner. Yeah. Thank you, Warren. All right. Great.